Kirchendal is in the heart of the Glens of Antrim. Uh, basically, it's a seaside village of a population of about 600, 1600 people. Uh, I look out at Scotland every day. The Mullican Tire is nine miles away. When we walk around the beach, we can at night you can see the cars of Scotland, and it's probably the king of the glens or the queen of the glens, whatever way you want to look at it. Uh, it's a beautiful area. It's it's the most I think untapped area of Ireland, maybe, and not there. Uh, but it's absolutely a beautiful area. But we don't play football, we don't play rugby, we don't play anything. The only passion here is hurling. Everybody's absorbed with the game of hurling and always has been in my lifetime. Um, maybe there's a close connection to Shinty in Scotland because we are so close to Scotland. That might be, a, some people, historians would remove that, that Shinty teams would have come over and played this game hurling and blah, blah, and vice versa. And I've played Shinty a few times myself against Scottish teams down through the years. Just as novelty fact, so that's maybe why. But it's it's arguably maybe the strongest area of hurling in Ulster, because well, we have other areas, South Derry, the Arts Peninsula, places like that where it's very strong too. But the Glens of Antrim seem to be as strong as anywhere in Ulster. Well. The reason I got involved in the GA, it wasn't really a conscious decision. Uh, I was born with a very bad speech impediment. Uh, well, I developed a very bad speech impediment and other kids seemed to mix well. And I just uh, wasn't a great mixer. Uh, but even to this day, I still feel awkward in company and that there. And I'm sure as I speak here, you'll see that I my speech is not as good as anybody else's, but I ended up popping a ball against the wall for Ed Lazar's and my own. And, and the one thing that I enjoyed, I wasn't, I was always a wee plump fella, very overweight uh, when I was really young and out there, but the big boys wanted me in their team, so that gave me confidence. And then I started going to the local club and out there, and older brothers were always out playing hard and took me to the field. And I just developed it. I love the game very fast and very fast. It just happened. Uh, most every young fella that grows up in the Glens or young girl that grows up in the Glens has a go at Camogie or Hurling at some time and, and I just happened to stick at it and I loved the game and to this day I'm still involved and still love it and that's basically how I get involved in the game of Hurling There's been a few down through the years at different times in my life obviously and out there, like I would say, the area I grew up in was a village or an area of cushioned all called Carnes. All the young fellas talked about in the street, and I ended up eventually getting involved in street hurling out there. But growing up, a uh, local teacher called Alec Emerson would have a great influence on me, Brian Thompson, local fellas got. And then when I progressed to playing for the county, a uh, guy, Jim Nelson, would have had a great influence on my career over the years. But Traditionally, same as every young fellow in Ireland, your family, your friends, your the environment you grew up in too affects you in a big way. And I was no different. I don't think I was ever really given a choice. I, I never made a conscious decision. I'm going to play Ireland or I'm, it just it evolved. I got me start in a rather strange way. I was rooming with a local fellow from the club back in 1981. I think it was, and traditionally the Antrim team would have went to Mass on a Sunday morning. Everybody had to go to Mass and things like that there. And the fellow I was rooming with, Sean McNaughton, he slept in, we didn't go to Mass. And because I was only 16, he came down, the managers dropped him because he didn't go to Mass. And they turned to me and he says, you're starting. So that's my first game I mine for playing for Antrim. And that's how I got me started because my clubmate didn't go to mass, so he could drop tight and start it. And I was given a bad boy uh, by ball because I was just 16 years of age. So, and I've been going to mass ever since. <laughs> and uh, an odd setting, I played uh, in Crow Park first as minor, but we never played Ulster minor championship. Antrim was in Leinster back then. So we had a place against Kilkenny 
Dublin, Wexford, and the, the rest of Leinster. So my first memory of uh, playing in Crow Park was against a Wexford team, I think, at minor level. So that was my first experience. But that was the old Crow Park back in the before the modern era with the big high fence and the pitch was a bit seesaw ice and but it was still Crow Park like it is a holy grail. Like for a young fella from the Glens of Anthem to go into Crow Park to play was phenomenal. Like but I've played quite a few times in Crow Park, but I would love to play it in the new Crow Park. But time doesn't stand still, so At the beginning, very amateurish, uh, lack of knowledge, I suppose, lack of experience, and that there for for our all Ireland semi, our, our all Ireland final, we get carried away. I've always said this: uh, we lost the competitive edge the day we won the semi final because subconsciously we were just happy to get to the final, that sort of thing. But but we would have stayed in the Grand Hotel in Malahide. Could have bust in things like that. We had always went down the night before because of we're so far away, like it was too far to travel to the game in the morning. So, and the Grand Hotel in Malahide always seemed to be our base when the games were in Dublin. Um, but we would have tried the best as, as we can, and out there was excitement of it all. Like, like most, like that doesn't change. Even the modern day player, you still have butterflies in your stomach on a Saturday night. And, a big game and you worry about getting exposed in Crow Park in front of everybody and your the adrenaline is showing all them sort of things. The, all them feelings are the same no matter what area you play in. They don't change. Well, uh, even back then, I'm, I'm a big music lover. Always have been. I love my favourite day out would be a good concert or something like that or I'm a massive Bruce Springsteen fan, ACDC, all back then. Believe it or not, I used to do a head banging back in the day when I was here. Uh, all them, because I've seen the Stones, all that sort of thing. So, but ACDC on the old Walkman or something back then, or something like that, you know, wouldn't have want to miss. Like, and I used to, uh, I used to room with a fella, Dominic McKinley, who one of my best friends out of Ireland and out there, and he was more of a Philomena Begley sort of guy, which I cringed about. He wasn't really into his ACDC, his Angus Young and Bruce Springsteen company and back then, or the Rolling Stones or something. So I used to torture him in the mornings of a game and out there. And to this day, we've still argued over music. So that's how I'd have gotten me zone. I would have tried to spin out, you know, back in black or something like that there back in the day, or even before that, you know, Bit of meatloaf, bad out of hell, or anything at all. It had to be loud, anyway. That's one thing. It had to be loud. <laughs> yeah, everybody, everybody deals with everything different. I had uh, Alkin McFed, who's in that team, and Alkin has got probably the best personality and the most frustrating personality of anybody I've ever met. Uh, he had this carefree attitude to life, and to this day, he's still the same. If you won by 18 points, it didn't matter. If you lost by 18 points, it didn't matter. The rest is would have come in after getting badly beaten, maybe very down and embarrassed and out there. And then Alton, he didn't care if you won and out there. He just this great and he was so talented and he was just sat and it, it never bothered, it never fizzed him anyway. What happened? Nothing going on. He just, he that level personality to this day is still the same. And, at times you'd have loved that personality, and other times you just want well, shake him up a bit, you know. He's just, but he's such a great guy. He's just letting you know, all the boys went into the toilet and come out. You know, you could see they were doing workouts in the toilets and stretching and doing exercises and all these different things. But I basically just, you know, focused on the job that I was going to have. Try and I'm a great believer in picture it at a so, you know, try and run the game through your mind. And uh, even back then, I suppose that's a bit of sports science or something back then. You were trying to picture yourself hurling well and trying to not to be over too determined, just stay in the zone and staying right. Um, fear nobody, respect everybody, and let's give the best shot you had. And that's the way I approached every game. You know, um, The only thing I always told every player that I coached there after, like, you can't guarantee what's going to happen out in the field. The only thing you can guarantee is you're going to be in a shift. 
try your best, and that's only the game might pass you by, the ball might not bounce for you or something, but don't get frustrated. Like, like a game's for 70 minutes, like, don't get worried if you make a mistake in the sixth minute. It shouldn't affect the tenth minute. And that's even back then, I would focus on that. If you did make a mistake or your man got a score off you or something, it was always the next ball that mattered. Focus on the next ball. And that's basically the way I went through my whole career. And I try to pass that on because it, it worked. Some days it worked very well for me, and other days maybe not so well. It'd be wrong to say you weren't nervous before every game. You know, I think if you're not nervous, you have a problem. I think uh, the angst is up, but you can't let it control. But usually, once you get into first ball through and you get at it, you just get into subconsciously you do what you do. You're not there. You've been playing ordinances on the ten, so you just get at it and you try and focus. And the, the big thing is to focus on what your job is and just do your job the best of your ability. But there was always nerves. You're always scared and have a Thing, but people would give you advice and you you look at other great sportsmen, what they done, what they do, try and learn things. You're always wanting to be this sponge to absorb information about other teams and what they've done and that there. But no, I think you need nerves. I think you need uh but some games were a bit more like we played a, a match here with against our local rivals four miles away, and that was probably the most nervous of the semi-final of a kind of, and it was a fear of losing to our local derby was probably the worst I ever experienced because it wasn't the nerves of the game, it was just the fear of losing. Like if if our neighbours were going to beat us, you're going to have to emigrate sort of thing. <laughs> and that's and that's what the GA's formed on. That's what we all love and not there. But no, uh, I wouldn't have said I was overly nervous. It never really got the better of me, I've got to be honest. The bigger the day, the bigger the name I had a mark, the more I seemed to enjoy. Like uh, if I had a fault it was raising for the games that didn't really matter. You always had games. It didn't really matter. And, and but bigger the occasion, bigger the name I had to mark, the more I seemed to enjoy it. And I think that's maybe a good thing in a way. But I loved, I loved the big days, and I loved marking the big names of my era. Well, and a big day in Crow Park, uh, which. I'm blessed to have the honour to do you not there. My old stand you used to sit in under, not there. You would hear the hum, the crowd. You know, there was like a, it wasn't, you couldn't make out what was chanting or what was going on, but there was noise. And then when you come out the tunnel down at the corner where it used to be, be between the canal end and the Hogan stand, this roar went up and not there, and the hairs would stand the back of your neck. And you run on and look up at Hill 16, all in saffron and white. And, it was just unbelievable the thing out there, but you had to get a hold of yourself and focus on what was going to happen in the next 70 minutes and out there. But it was brilliant, the excitement of it. I mean, getting off the bus outside Croke Park, this is before the tunnels where they used to get dropped off outside. This old lady came up to me and put rosy beads in my hand. We stories they got there stick in your head about things they got just happened and what it meant to people and driving down Jones's Road and the crowd there and out there. And, it was hard not to get caught up, but you had to try and as be professionally sound and focus on what your job was. I've always believed any 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 kid that picks up a hurl their dream has to be playing in All Ireland. That should be the ultimate goal. And um, it's great. And um, because you don't get there, that doesn't mean you failed that there, but it's rather than the destination, it's the journey that's more important and I've always felt that like, like I've said it hundreds of times I played 23 years at a senior level and not there and it ended in failure every single year but I don't feel a failure and not there but it was the journey was most important but to play to stand for the soldier song on all Ireland final day was probably one of the greatest achievements I will ever achieve or and I think any hurler that has a patient and there's nothing wrong with ambition. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be the best. Or like some people are happy kicking the ball. Other people want to score goals and not there. And to me, one of my greatest sporting achievements stand for the soldier's song and all Ireland final day. There's just it's just something about it. Like
I have a lot. I have a lot of disappointments. I have a lot of success at club level, and even there were some days in under me of great success and not there. But I suppose, look, and everybody expects me to say the awfully game, beaten awfully that day and not there. But uh, that was, there's no doubt, because of the, the, the level of the game I was at, Offaly were one of the top tier teams at that time and beating them in an all iron semi final and going to the well so often and getting not getting a drink before and that there it was great just to get over that line and that there. But I had great days with my club, brilliant days with my club in my own county and things like that. But probably you'd have to say the Offaly day and getting to the all iron final was the ultimate for a hurler because of the level it was at. You were playing against some of the best hurlers of their generation at that time. And you were competing, and you came off the field with respectability. It was a big thing for us as a team to get that bit of respectability because traditionally Ulster hurling is the poor relation, and to be at the top table and sometimes take the middle off them, that was a great achievement for us that day, and that would have to be it. I've had I have great days against some of the best hurlers. Of my generation, I remember having a great day against Joe Cooney and people like that. But like, there's local lads I struggle with in my own club here and things like that. There's just you just seem to have these hoodoo players and back to maybe not not been up for the game in the right sense and things like that. But probably if you're in a roundabout way, you're maybe asking me who's the best player I ever played against. And DJ Carey would have to be up there. Joe Cooney, Nicholas English. Jared Henderson, Michael Coleman, all them sort of players. John Fenton, my generation. Jared Henderson, like what a player! Like it's hard to pick one out because in any given day you were, you know, I can never single one out because there are some not household names that give me more trouble than maybe some of the household names did, if you know what I mean. So, like, I learned a bit less than one time about respect and everybody and fear and nobody, and that they didn't respect somebody and. I got totally cleaned out and out there. It was back to them days of maybe not been up for certain matches and up more for others and out there were. So I learned the lesson about respecting everybody and fear nobody. But if you're asking me who's the best, you'd have to go with DJ, English, Cooney, people like that. You know, <clears throat> and there's, I could spend the next hour going over a more list of names that were everybody's good and out there, you know, and there's a lot of guys and counties that never get a mention like that Kildare team I played on there was a guy Walsh playing on it was a phenomenal hurler you go to Meath there was fellas there David Kilcoyne or West Meath and people like that that never never the weaker saw counties and even in Derry like the Keevers and the Downs the Marty Malmans and Paddy Branagh and people like that were as good hurlers as they would have walked on to any team but just because they come from the perceived weaker counties they never get that recognition so but that's you know, some days, more often than not, there were some very tough opponents. But tournament was different then. It was more man on man sort of stuff, and not there. Some days it was tougher because the guy you were marking was maybe twice as sizey and twice as strong and things like that. There, you know, rather than side step, you just decided to walk over the top. <laughs> to be honest. To be really honest, embarrassed a wee bit because I could spend the next ten hours raiming off players that probably I felt they deserved it more and not there. But I understand Crow Park's thing. You know, like I don't think it's just about how many All Irelands you won. I don't think you can compete with that because obviously it's geography plays a big part on it, the size of the county, the size, all that sort of thing. To be honest, it has to be one of the greatest individual honours any GA person could have. To think that when I'm long gone, that my name will remain in Crow Park is like that special, like it is, like, you know, like some guys, maybe my great great grandchildren will walk in someday and that was my great great granddad or something, or I don't know. Just wee things I got there for, for my family and for my club, especially like my club. Uh, we're kind of like new money in Antrim, if you know what I mean. Like we we came on the scene in the early eighties, and thankfully we're here ever since. It's good to see that that maybe the local people can believe that people out of the glens of Antrim, and I hope that somewhere down the road I'll give 
inspiration to the fellas in Donegal and Cavan and out there that they can gain at the top table too. The geography shouldn't be that much against you. If you want it bad enough, you can achieve it. And I, I'm absolutely thrilled about it and out there, but I do cringe when I see some of the names. I think some of the names that aren't in there, but that's life. I don't pick these awards, so I'm not going to start judging people that pick them. So whenever it be like, I know there's as good a hurlers as me have never been in there or, or better hurlers than me that never won an all-star. But that's like, that's that's just the way sport does in every generation. That's what sport's about. It's about the crack and the development out there. But I don't take myself too serious about it out there. I, as I said earlier, I really enjoyed the journey and that's success to me, the fact that I was on it. It's easy to dream. Everybody has dreams, but you gotta you gotta walk the talk. You gotta do it. Like, like there's no secret to it now. Like, there's no difference now than a, a TJ Reid than there was a Jared Henderson out there. You gotta want it bad enough and like fall down seven times, get up it. Them. So you gotta have that mentality. You, you gotta you gotta be prepared for failure. Like, um, failure uh, failure is a good thing. You learn from failure, and you're gonna fail. Everybody fails and that there and I and I don't believe that if you want to be a great hurler, it, it doesn't matter where you come from in Ireland. It doesn't matter what club you have, because your club's not a traditional big club within your county or your county's not a big county within your province or your country or your Ireland and that there. You can be the best you can be. And I would say the one thing I give kids if you have problems going along, maybe you should look in the mirror before you look out the window. There's a problem might lie with you. If if you know if if you're not getting on the team, there's a reason, probably, and that there and make you go and you make the coach and you make the manager so it's impossible to leave you off the team, and that there and just you you decide you're going to decide how good you are, not not anybody. Nobody has the right to decide where you succeed or fail. You decide that yourself, and I think that's the one you make the decisions in your life. Let nobody make decisions for you. Well, I suppose again back to the All Ireland stand for that soldier songs of memory. But I think me, I'm really, really proud of having my county titles for my club. I'm really proud of the fact that I played for 17 years, 18 years, whatever it was for Andrew. Uh, I the highlight is the highlight for me. I always say this, and it's easy for me to say this because I don't have an All Ireland medal out there. But I think the highlight for me is that. I played against at a high level and I played against some of the greatest people that ever graced the hurling field and out there. And to me, that's success. The fact that I was there with them shoulder to shoulder through that there, like playing the game, it was always about the game. I loved the game. I still love the game. And it's always a fact that I got to play the greatest game in the world is success.